any man is part of this cycle of life, forming a passive part. You see, the great prophecies of the Bible bring present-day events into focus. Hello and welcome to South Pacific Classics. I'm Alan Lindsay. In exploring our film archives, we've come across some fascinating footage that for younger viewers will be a window into history. For the rest of us, the images and sounds of the past may well trigger some memories. If you have a map of the world, you might be forgiven for mistaking the shooting location of our first film for specks of fly dirt over the equator. The Gilbert Islands, now known as Kiribati, are coral atolls scattered through the Pacific Ocean over an area spanning around 3,000 kilometres. The film also covers the neighbouring Ellis Islands, now Tuvalu, the New Hebrides, now Vanuatu, and New Caledonia, which remains a French colony to this day. But despite the remoteness of the locations, by the time this film was shot in 1975, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was well established in the area. This film was produced with the intent of encouraging church members in Australia and New Zealand to support mission work in the Micronesia region, particularly in the maintenance of the schools. I know you'll enjoy World of Islands. When seafaring peoples of long ago discovered the islands and atolls of the South Pacific, they chose a habitat as beautiful as any to be found on Earth. Thatched villages hidden in forests of palms, the nostalgic song of the trade winds, and the murmuring of the restless sea. These are the sights and sounds that make the far islands of the Pacific a world apart. The Gilbert Islands form a long chain of coral atolls straddling the equator and basking under a tropical sun. A generation ago, these now peaceful shores were a fierce battleground as nations fought to gain control of the Pacific arena. Servicemen who survived the Holocaust will remember when these guns belched death and destruction and the beaches of Tarawa ran red with blood. But all is quiet now. Rusting guns gaze out to sea with sightless eyes and broken muzzles. And the soft-toned sea keeps its tragic secrets. Centuries ago, less sophisticated warriors found these atolls and adapted their lives to the seemingly idyllic environment. Yet, life on these remote strips of coral has its limitations. There are no mountains or rich volcanic soil here. And these narrow outcrops of coral rock and salt-laden sand grow little food. The only garden vegetable is a variety of taro called babai, whose tough and somewhat tasteless root slowly matures in swampy pits of brackish water. Were it not for fish from the lagoon and the salt-tolerant coconut, the first Micronesian settlers may never have survived. As in most Pacific islands, Life in the Gilberts is easy and unhurried. Fishermen mend their nets or make new ones, obviously aware of the advantages of modern materials. But by methods as old as their tribal history, the catch is dried in the hot sun and stored for future use. When the tide is out, women gather shellfish along the shore of the lagoon and sort the harvest for quality and size. Here, the climate is always warm, and housing of the simplest kind is sufficient protection from the rare phenomenon known as rain. The age of cloth has brought an added chore to island housewives, who are their own washing machines. But there's plenty of time here for traditional things, such as weaving sleeping mats from strips of dried pandanus leaf. What could be more relaxing than creating dainty hair decorations from fragrant tropical flowers? While most of the Gilbert Islands are without modern transport, 
On Tarawa, you only walk if you prefer it. Believe it or not, a bus service runs the length of the island. The post-war period has brought the automobile and an influx of motorcycles for those who can afford to buy the gasoline. There are no traffic lights yet, but towns are growing and the trade stores have products from all over the world. However, these are not affluent islands. Virtually the only export is copra or dried coconut and the earning capacity of the people is low. Nevertheless, a new age dawns in this tranquil world of islands. And part of the new age is the aeroplane. The Gilberts and their neighbours, the Ellis Islands, are scattered over thousands of square miles of ocean. Sea travel in small launches can be frustratingly slow, but aircraft have shrunk the vast distances. A twin-engined Aztec, one of the air fleet of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, links the lonely islands of this region. Operated by missionary pilots, this plane carries personnel and supplies and helps church leaders establish a closer rapport with the island people. Education is of great importance to balance development in these islands, and schools at various levels are adding a new dimension to the South Pacific way of life. This is reflected in the happy, healthy faces of children and youth in the island villages. Secondary education is cared for on the island of Abamama, where an Adventist high school has been operating for a number of years. Here, Micronesian youth from many islands gather to fit themselves for a more fulfilling life in their home communities, with the added rewards that Christian education can bring. Considering their isolated background, these young people do well at their studies and are anxious to learn. Books push back their limited horizons and new doors of the mind are opened. For relaxation, there's always the warm lagoon and a fishing net. And it's fun even if you don't catch any fish. On these semi-arid islands, where arable soil is almost non-existent, there is the constant problem of finding fresh food. A staff member from the Solomon Islands is growing green vegetables in experimental beds of specially gathered leaf humus. Once more, the coconut is a lifesaver on these coral atolls. the people have devised a method of tapping the flower stem at the crown of the coconut palm. Overnight, a sweet, vitamin-rich liquid seeps from the cut end of the fleshy stem and is cleverly channeled into a hanging bottle. This drink is known in the islands as toddy. And all students of the school have their daily bottle of fresh coconut elixir to help maintain health in an environment where food variety is so limited. Toddy bottles are hung on the trees with handmade coconut fibre cordage. The manufacture of cordage is a continuing task for the girls, using this traditionally simple method. The feeding of a large group of hungry students requires the use of imported rice. Because Kuma School on Abemama is still in the developing stage, the dining room is in the great outdoors. A fine idea except when it rains. Church administrators are already planning to upgrade the school facilities with additional classrooms, new dining rooms, better dormitories, and staff housing of a more permanent nature. Owing to lack of trade opportunities and a restricted economy, the finances of the Gilbert Island people are very limited. Most of the finance required for educational expansion comes from outside sources. Church members and their friends in affluent countries overseas continue to give generously to these projects. The greatest investment for the future in the islands lies in the development of the young people. Gilbertese youth of today were born in the period of transition from ancient tribal custom to the new age of westernization. A balanced, Christian-motivated education will help smooth out some of the problems in these times of change and give fulfilling and eternal values to the island people.
More than 30 years later, the Kalmar Adventist High School featured in that piece is still going strong with a student population of 300. Students bring much needed skills and education upon their return to their home communities. The school also presents an opportunity for students to be challenged spiritually and make decisions about the direction of their lives. Kalmar Adventist High School recently celebrated the baptism of nearly 100 students with 25 more students expressing an interest in being baptised in the near future. We'll be back with more South Pacific Classics after the break. Welcome back to South Pacific Classics. The film we're about to see was commissioned in the late 60s by the Far Eastern Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The film covers a number of locations, the island of Palau in Micronesia, the Philippines, Borneo and Hong Kong, illustrating the diversity of cultures and settings for the work of the church. Like a number of films we feature on this show, The Man from Micronesia was aimed at encouraging church members to support the work of overseas missions. To this day, many Adventist churches use their weekly Sabbath school meeting to focus on the activities of the global church and the needs of the local population in various parts of the world. The man from Micronesia is likely to have been used in this context. So sit back and enjoy. Swaying palms, gleaming coral beaches, the song of the surf on the distant reef. These are the mind pictures of the Pacific that have called men from afar to find warm seas and islands in the sun. But long before tourists invaded the Pacific, seeking release from the cares of civilization, tribes of hardy seafarers discovered this world of islands. They established their early cultures and left strange stone relics for future generations to study and travelers to photograph. These ocean wanderers found other islands and over the centuries continued a tradition of the simple life. For here, nature was bountiful and the climate kind. Into this idyllic setting was born a brown-skinned son of the sea. His name was Willie. Sprinkled like emeralds across the great ocean are the myriad islands of Micronesia. Some are tiny outcrops of jungle-covered coral, undercut by the eroding sea. Larger ones are the habitat of tribal people, isolated by time and space from the tumult of the outside world. Palau is part of the Western Carolines, set far out in the vast Pacific, Little Willie grew up in these carefree surroundings, where the lagoon was an ideal playground for small, fun-loving boys. But even in Palau, you can't play all the time. Willie followed the other children to school in the old village council house. His long process of education had begun. came a terrible war in the Pacific. The peace of the islands was shattered. A 
and thousands of servicemen lost their lives on these ill-fated shores. Now, rusting hardware hides in the jungle as nature seeks to cover the scars. And along the shoreline, wartime hulks slowly disintegrate, victims of time and tide. These islands are now a trust territory of the United States, and the new Karor Post Office symbolizes progress in this town. During the war, Willie's people fled to the safety of the swamps and the hidden waterways of the islands. The years slid by, and Willie grew into young manhood. Now he pondered, what would he do with his life? Searching for an answer, he attended meetings in the Karor Seventh-day Adventist Church. After deep study, he was convinced of Bible truth. Although his forefathers were spirit worshippers, Willie became a Christian. The young man now traveled north to the island of Guam. Agana, once the old Spanish capital, is now an American outpost in the Pacific. Here, modern architecture reflects the beauty of the tropics. But Willie's purpose in going to Guam was to further his education at the Adventist Academy where he worked and studied for four years. With the necessity of earning a living, Willie returned to his home island to be employed as a clerk in the local store. Then came another opportunity for advancement. He gained the position of assistant public defender in the Karor Courthouse. Manila, in the Philippines and a new adventure for Willie. He had been chosen to represent his islands at the Far Eastern Youth Congress held in this city in 1961. Here, the young Micronesian was impressed by the extent of Adventist work in the Far East. He saw the fine sanitarium and hospital, the Philippine publishing house, and of course, Philippine Union College. Willie's horizons were widened as he met young people from other countries attending the meetings. He came away from the Congress greatly inspired and with the firm determination to enter the gospel ministry. Back in Palau, he accepted a teaching post at the Adventist Mission School. He also became an intern pastor of the local church. And then his dream came true. Aided by a mission scholarship, Willie returned to Manila to take an extended course at Philippine College. Once again, he caught a vision of the extent of his church's outreach as he associated with a group of students from 18 different countries. These included Africa, the Middle East, and the many lands of Southeast Asia. Language and cultural barriers are forgotten as these fine young people mingle happily in work and play. After five years of hard study, the man from Micronesia graduated with a master's degree in theology. Just a short ferry ride across the channel from Karor is a fertile island. Here among rolling green hills, an academy for the youth of Micronesia has recently been completed. But even in the tropics, a lush green campus does not spring up overnight. A special offering given by Adventist Sabbath schools around the world has made this fine academy possible. Overseas and national personnel working together with student missionaries from the United States make up the teaching staff of this training school. Instruction here is in English. Pastor Willie Navo, now returned to his Micronesian islands, is the highly esteemed theology teacher at Palau Academy. And his wife, Hadsumi, is the Dean of Girls. Besides the usual academic subjects, 
young ladies learn typing and other manual skills. Youthful energy is expended on the playing field, where physical exercise ensures healthy bodies and good appetites. When mealtime comes around, the students are ready for the tasty food served in the modern canteen. <laughs> Having graduated from Palau Academy, many of these youth will go on to Philippine College for further study. They will later return to their various home islands and contribute much to the spiritual and social lives of their people. Beyond the reef and far over the distant horizons are other islands and other peoples. Sailing in frail canoes from Southeast Asia many centuries ago, the Sea Dayaks found the lonely shores of the great island of Borneo. Some of these tribes pushed inland and established longhouse communities along the riverbanks. They cultivated rice and devised simple methods of food preparation. Dayak culture includes dancing in traditional costume to the music of hand-beaten gongs. The warriors portray a rhythmic story of fierce battles and victories won. Missionary Dick Hall has come up river in a canoe to conduct a dental clinic at a Dayak village. So isolated are these people that without such periodic visits, they would have little or no medical care. A village woman is seriously ill and must be taken to a distant hospital over the mountains. Unable to take food for many days. The woman is very weak and is carefully placed in the narrow canoe. Emergencies such as this are frequent among these jungle communities. But on this occasion, the missionary can help save a life. For downstream, his aircraft is waiting. Despite rain, which is now beginning to fall, the patient is transferred to the mission plane. As Dick Hall takes off on this mercy flight, he knows that many primitive areas have no landing fields. But the day is envisioned when well-equipped medical launches will ply Borneo's winding waterways bringing on-the-spot aid to people in need. Among many of the Dayak tribes, the way of life has already changed, as is evidenced by this Adventist church in the jungle. There are others like this in Sarawak and adjoining areas. The children, clean and happy, meet in their own rooms to sing their gospel songs. Many of these inexpensive lamb shelters, as they are colorfully called, have already been built. And more are planned for the jungle lambs who are still waiting. Hong Kong, crossroads of the Orient. Adventist medical care for the millions of Hong Kong includes a super modern hospital, recently completed. And the well-established Tsun Wan Hospital in the New Territories. But sadly, because of lack of staff and funds, this only touches the fringe of the need in many places. Can we allow apathy and selfishness to build a barrier between us and our fellow human beings? Apathy must be replaced by empathy and compassion. A voice of hope must reach the dark alleys of this world's human need whether it be in the far-off islands of Micronesia, the crowded cities of Southeast Asia, or among a remote jungle tribe. A little thought, a little care, 
yes, and some sacrifice, will ease a pain and lift a load and help weave the fabric of love and goodwill among all men. The Man from Micronesia was produced by the late Eric Weir, a talented filmmaker who spent some decades illustrating the work of the church via the moving image. For those of us involved in Christian media, the work of Eric Weir is a reminder that good filmmaking involves creativity, commitment to quality and attention to detail. Eric Weir's itinerary for The Man from Micronesia would have been exhausting in itself, although the quiet lagoons and resort swimming pools would have offered some compensation. The use of Willie in the title role shows that Eric Weir wanted to provide more than a guided tour of church institutions. In basing The Man from Micronesia around the character of Willie, the film reminds us that the work of the church is not fundamentally about programs and buildings. It's about people. See you next time. <laughs>